On today's podcast, we are speaking with Tobin Lehman, and he is the founder of New North, an award-winning digital marketing agency dedicated to helping B2B technology firms grow. Over the last two decades, he's been working with brands like Southern States, Pfizer, Thermo Fisher Scientific, Kimberly Clark, and a host of others. Tobin's earned an industry reputation for taking the mystery out of marketing with clear strategies that earn results. He currently resides in Frederick, Maryland with his spouse and five children. And to learn more about him and his book, ridethetornado.com, we will listen in. But first, I need to tell you about schedule once it's a tool that we use to be able to book our podcastings to book my schedule people can choose when they want to get onto my calendar and it is amazing right we're automating it we're making it work for us and we're integrating it into all of our programming that we do when people want to book time with us or even pay to book time with us uh, to consult with them or to help them with their marketing so schedule once is a tool of once hub and then there's also chat bots and all kinds of fun things within this program that you can utilize the cost is very reasonable and if you use my link go to peppershock.com slash offers, and you can get a special rate with that. And so do I. So go to peppershock.com slash offers, find out about Once Hub and the Schedule Once tool that's within it, uh, as well as the chat bots and all the fun things that you can do with this program. You're going to love it. So again, go to peppershock.com slash offers and select the Schedule Once link to then Figure out how you can integrate this in with your calendars. And if you need help, we can help you. We've done it for us. And now we can do it for others as well. Uh, okay. And then I need to tell you about my marketing essentials moment, right? The essentials that you need to go on a marketing expedition. And so this time I want to talk to you all about what's happening with voice search. So we've heard of search engine optimization. Uh, we've heard of you know mobile responsiveness, right? And now we're thinking more and more about how voice search can be utilized to help you with your branding, right? And help you answer questions when people are asking Siri or Google Home or Alexa or any of those devices, right? Uh, so now voice search, it's basically a person's query in answering questions, getting questions answered. And so when your site or your information can be presented as one of the first answers, right? Then uh, it's gonna go with your answer. So if you can think about how you would go through and answer questions and how you can optimize to be able to answer questions within the, the verbiage that you're using on your website, right? And, and think about how the search results will be presented when utilizing the voice artificial intelligence to present that answer, right? And it's going to pop up the first thing that it sees and answer that question. And people usually just take the first thing that is told to them, right? 58% of businesses have been locally found using a voice search in the last 12 months. And this data is according to WordStream. And 45% look for a business locally every day. 27% visit a local company website after conducting a voice search. So it's really important, right? to understand how these speakers are presenting this information to us in order to get our searches up there in the voice search optimization. Uh, and most of them happen, 56%, most of them happen, will also happen on a smartphone device, not just the uh, devices that you have in your home, right, or at your office. And it's 30 times more likely to be actionable with a voice search than anything else. So voice search is becoming more and more prevalent, more and more important. We can help with that. If that's something that you need, we want to help you with that. So without further ado, let's listen all about more digital marketing and B2B marketing and all the things that are happening within the future. And our author that is going to share with us a lot of good information. Uh, you may even want to pause and take some notes here because he's got some good nuggets for you. So let's listen in to Tobin's interview. Welcome to Pepper Shock Media's Marketing Expedition Podcast, keeping you up to date with the latest in marketing and advertising. Now, here's your host, Ray Allen. 
Welcome to the Marketing Expedition Podcast. I'm your host, Ray Allen. I'm the president and CEO of Pepper Shock Media and the founder of the Marketing Expedition Community and Podcast. And today's guest is Tobin Lehman. Welcome, Tobin, to the show. Yeah, thank you. Good to be here. So, Tobin, tell our audience a little bit about your background. I know we did the bio, but just share from your own words, kind of, you know, your history, your past, your journey of what got you to where you are now. Yeah, absolutely. That actually ties a bit into the book, too. But the um, basically what kind of happened to me, as I'm sure happened to, to many people kind of in the early 2000s when I came out of school, is we, you know, I actually have a degree in design, you know, graphic design. And, you know, the, the web was bubbling and had its first burst at that point. And really, as I entered the agency world, as I entered um, in the marketing world, there was all these new digital tools. Um, you know, I was there. I started this career before Facebook, if people can believe that before Google ads, before Google analytics, before so many of these tools that we think are, you know, quote unquote, household names now uh, came about in the early days of my career. And so being uh, kind of the nerd of the group, um, they were assigned to me to go, go handle. And, you know, um, my, my background, even in school is design, but I was also fairly ahead in math as well. I've always had this kind of engineering kind of analytics data kind of side, always this, this design creative side, really this problem solving nature. So I think that kind of came through. And so they threw these tools at me, started understanding them, started getting into it. And you know, Google ads hits the market, and analytics goes forward. Then we start, the iPhone comes out and I was like, wow, this is totally crazy. And so um, really just being able to be on what I would call the crest of the wave of what's happened in the last two decades with technology and how it impacts our lives and marketing um, really is what drove me to then start New North as an agency, um, really serving those tools really to a, a digital tech market as well. Um, and I you know, founded this agency uh, let's see, 13 years ago now and really just been going forward on that wave as things keep changing and keep um, adapting. That's really where we find ourselves kind of looking at solving problems, dealing with the new situations that kind of confront us in the marketing space. And so you've selected the name New North. Tell me a little bit more about that. I mean, I can guess, but I always like to hear kind of the brand story. What made you decide that name? Well, in, in all secretness, there's not a whole lot to it. Um, it's not, there's no grand story. You know, people say I should make up one, but really we wanted something that was simple, easy to remember, catchy, um, but also really just pointed towards this idea of kind of a, a new, new horizon, a new, a new frontier, a new direction. Um, because most people, even most businesses still entering the digital space. Um, I mean, most businesses got catapulted into the digital last year um, if they weren't there already. Um, it's, it's a new thing. It's a new understanding. And so how do, you, how do you kind of adjust? How do you put a compass to that? You put a North Star, if you will, towards your activities and that guiding. And so how many people understand a new direction, kind of what the new goals should really be using digital marketing has always been kind of the mainstay, being the data guy, being the analytics guy, being the digital tools team, um, we really help people chart that path. And so that's kind of the, actually more of the working title of what it means versus any kind of backstory. So we see that and really people embrace that as we work with them. Excellent. And where do you operate out of? What, what part of the country? Oh, so we're just outside of DC. It's in a, I have a bedroom community called Frederick. It's a nice uh, town, but um, our clients are actually all over the U.S. And so we're kind of a unique niche kind of business. And so we have clients all the way in the West Coast. We have actually a handful of clients in the European space as well. So um, our business reaches all aspects of the world just because we're in a very small niche, which is in B2B tech. So um, doing B2B tech marketing and services and things like that. It's a, it's a strange niche market, but it um, provides us kind of access to really interesting clients and companies all through the globe because now you've kind of had this global, you know, ex expansion, how has the pandemic kind of changed things for you and your clients now that you've been able to, to expand that way? What, what are some things that you think of that has really kind of fueled the business? Well, I think more, more than ever, people recognize the need for digital, right? They, they, they realize that, hey, this, this thing is for real. The, the, the idea of reaching customers, doing sales, doing marketing all through the computer um, only even um, is just big. I mean, a lot of companies, Fortune 500, you know, et cetera, were already there. But just the, the reallocation, we're seeing more and more of that. Um, but I also see a, a turn to just really the... Uh, say this the nice way, kind of the, 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 maybe the dusty corners of businesses where maybe they left brand sitting on the side for a while. 
And they realize that it's not just going out there and spending money on digital. It's actually having something worthwhile to say. And, and the fact that there's more competition in the market, more, um, you know, kind of kind of noise, if you will, there's only so many ads someone can consume. There's only so much, uh, you know, social media people can consume. And so it just as every marketing channel, it's all about the message and, and getting the attention. And so we've seen a lot of work actually in the past year actually around brand, which seems kind of counterintuitive, but the reality is they realize they're just not swinging a heavy bat. If I use that kind of metaphor, they need to actually get something worthwhile to say versus just paying to play because everything got got really cheap all of a sudden in like March and April, and then it got really expensive by the end of the year. Um, things really ramped up because everyone was going onto digital, onto paid. Um, and so we're seeing really that movement of holistically looking at the, the company again from a big picture perspective now that we're more of our spends in, in digital and does our brand does our messaging really cross over into that place? And so tell me a little bit about your team and some of the um, roles that you have uh, a part of your team and who does what and how they all work together. Sure, sure, sure. So um, we're actually a small team because we're in kind of a niche business. And so we kind of see ourselves a little, little bit like a, a little bit of a special ops SWAT team kind of approach. And so we have a, a brand strategist that deals with brand work specifically. Um, we have technologists, um, kind of a different way of looking at the firm, but we don't have like programmers specifically. We have programmers, but we really have technologists because so much of what we do is web dev, but there's also this API, there's data, there's all kinds of technologies. And so in a lot of cases we manage what we'd call like a MarTech stack, a marketing technology stack. And so we really have technologists that um, do that. There's lots of cross crossbreeding. We have copywriters, traditionally designers, um, and as well as you know, account people that manage you know the relationships and expectations and things like that. So kind of a strange little piece, and obviously paid media is part of that too. So we we look in, in the outside probably like a traditional agency in a lot of cases from an operational perspective, but the roles and the tools we use are a bit different because we're you know 100% digital, and that means a lot these days because it's not just ads, it's CRMs, it's HubSpots, it's Marketos, it's Eloquas, it's all kinds of automation tools and data platforms and putting that all together actually ends up being on our end of the, the, the court, so to speak. Yeah, it's definitely expanding and growing in the digital space and, and being able to do all the things that you can do and track and, and all of that. So now that you have uh, been in this digital place and done these things, how has the new privacy rules affected what you're doing for, for business? And maybe for those that don't know, uh, you know, new updates have occurred and, you know, location tracking and all of those types of things. I'm curious to know how you've been able to kind of work around it or work with it. What's, what, what's happening in your world right now with all the changes? That's a great question. And I, I, I wish less was happening in that world, honestly. Um, you know, th there's companies that are taking it, you know, taking responsibility for it. Like Google's already started proactively thinking of different solutions. And so we're, we're a lot of cases, we're just stuck behind the vendors. We're stuck behind the tools, what the tools can capably do. Um, because we also, as I mentioned, work in the European space. We've been dealing with GPDR for years now. So we know what that looks like um, to be cookie list or to be completely opt in. And so I think, I think it's coming. I, I kind of make a joke every sales call, like we're going to do all this stuff till we can't do it anymore because it, it will, it will get blocked. We will likely have something like that here, whether it's kind of mandated by the government or at least the vendors themselves like Google and different tools uh, change their methodology, which that's probably a whole other podcast in itself for that, that, that stance. I think we have a pretty, um, you know, more, more aggressive stance on that. I think, you know, than, than most people, but I think that it's gonna keep changing and, and ultimately all the benefit we had with digital, with kind of tracking people, I mean, micro tracking one individual across multiple websites, multiple different interactions, um, which did help a lot of cases, will just push us back to, you know, kind of re rewind the clock almost to two decades to say, now we just have macro metrics. All we can see is, people and groups and we can't see individuals anymore, individual habits and demographics and things. So I think it's kind of a, a boon time right now in digital marketing and it's, it's going to change. We've already seen it change in the European space. And, you know, it does create attribution challenges. It does create some of this, but some people would argue that attribution's a, a fantasy anyway, but um, I think we're seeing it more so trying to get back to that, which is, you know, kind of that previous conversation. It's, 
pushing people to get more back to basics with brand, with kind of managing channels for performance. Um, all the same things are in play, but we just have less data to look at um, and rather make, make bigger decisions with less information. And do you see maybe somewhat in the future things changing even more and how people are interacting with uh, privacy rights and laws and things. I mean, obviously we don't have a crystal ball, but what do you see happening Mm -hmm. in the near future? You know, six months, a year from now, maybe even, you know, even longer, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that, um, I think we're going to see a bigger change. I think this is just the beginning. I, I think I guess I think I, I believe that we likely need some kind of more regulations on this. Like, you know, we have, and it sounds crazy probably to some people, we have, you know, we have regulations on cigarettes. We're going to need it on the internet too, right? We're going to need something like that. I think as a, as a culture, as a people, as a group, because there's just a lot there that is untethered. And I'm, I mean, I'm definitely more of a free will kind of person and, you know, kind of each rule their own. But in the same sense, I think there's going to need to be something more that we do. But the Internet's so new, right? Comparatively in, in kind of human history, it's so new. Um, so we're going to need to figure things out. And so I think there'll be more. And we're seeing private industry doing a lot more with that. I mean, I've got kids and I've seen you know, great technology advance with blocking and router controls and things like that. And the Internet is getting kind of clinched in and there's great technologies like um i forget the name of it right now but i just saw a really cool um, piece of technology that allowed the user to opt in to ads and get paid for the ads themselves um i see i expect more and more of that kind of stuff happening where it just the the first market kind of wave which has happened over the last 10 20 years is going to fade and now you're gonna have more technologies that are more focused on the user the users has more control of what they can do and use in that space and so I think it's actually going to probably get harder for digital marketing in the future. It's going to be um, more like traditional where you, you, you count billboard by the number of cars that drive by, right? It's just, there's going to be no better metrics than that because of our kind of treasuring autonomy in the U.S., which is good um, that we're just going to lose some of that tracking data. So I could see less and less data available, um, but still needing to do it because it's where the attention is. So let's talk a bit about your book and, um, mm-hmm. you know, why, the why behind it and what you mm-hmm. um, want your audience to, to really uh, glean from reading it, right? And what, what kind of things that they're going to pick up if they do read it. Yeah, that's great. So the, so the Ride of Tornado, the, the whole idea of this book is pretty much what we've been talking about is what's going to happen in the future, right? What's going to happen around the corner? Um, you know, kind of a strange story is, you know, I actually wrote most of this book it was done kind of in manuscript form by December of 2019. So I was done before the pandemic thinking like, "Eh, that's a book about change, like things are happening, but you know, it's just kind of a normal change. (laughs) Um, Obviously then, you know, last year hit. And, you know, the, the reality is that unless you actually had a plan to manage change, you failed last year, right? I mean, who, who's 12 month, who's 2020 marketing plan went off the way they thought it was going to go. No one's, um, right? And that's a broad statement, easy to say in a pandemic, but I actually argue the same thing happens every year, that most marketing plans that are that long don't work. And so when you throw away a 12 month marketing plan, because the reality is too many things change in any given year, any given month, um, new technologies come out, new social media platforms, new digital tools, GPDR, cookie lists, all these things keep happening in this space specifically. Um, you can't have a a long-term strategy. You need to have a plan to plan. (laughs) You need a strategy to actually do your work. And so that's where Ride to Tornado comes in. So we've developed as an agency, because we've been on this bleeding edge, this wave um, for many years, the strategy trying, you know, kind of rapid thinking and execution platform is to be agile in that sense. And I don't, I don't call it agile because that gets really convoluted very quickly by a lot of people and a lot of different agile mindsets. But the, real, the reality is just rapidly thinking and executing your marketing is the only plan you can really have in this day and age. That's the argument we're making. And it comes from our own work. Um, the reality is, you know, a 30 day plan, 90 day plan, that's about as good as you can go. You have, um, you know, the ability to kind of do annual goals like any other business would do. But the reality is to sit there and spend months planning a 12 month marketing plan, huge waste of time. I think most people, most marketers, experienced marketers would agree with that in the, in the broad strokes. And so the book is really our process, actually from the agency, kind of turning it inside out, saying, hey, go take this and run with this. Most of the questions I get from people I meet or talk to or 
from speaking engagements really come around that idea like what do you think of this what do you think of cookie list what do you think of of uh, this new social media platform do you think this is going to work out what about clubhouse the reality is all the answers to every one of those questions is just really like well you need a plan to deal with that what's your plan to adjust to change because the reality is that we're for you know going off for every sparkle and you know kind of shimmer that happens in the market we're just chasing those the reality is when you have a platform and a plan that allows us to kind of adjust and experiment with those. And so that was kind of the genesis of the book is saying, this is what we do every day. People are asking us about this. Let's just put our process to work and let people go and do it and see if it you know, gets the benefits that they really want. Because the, the reality is, so as a manager, as a marketing manager, as a marketer, you know, there's so much going on. You, you must need a, a way of working, a strategy and a way of working, a way of adjusting to change. And this is what the book gives you. And so when did you launch your book? So this January, actually this past January. So during the pandemic and when everything was kind of coming to where, you know, un uncertainty of time. So it's good to mm -hmm. kind of almost try to predict the future of what's going to happen. But, you know, it's just interesting because we don't always know what's going to go on. And we didn't know that all this is going to happen and all the changes that are going to continue. What do you mm -hmm. think, you know, BC before COVID to, mm -hmm. you know, maybe pre pandemic or after pandemic, post pandemic, um, mm -hmm. some of those changes that occurred, what do you think is going to continue to stay now um, because of the pandemic? Well, from a marketing perspective, I, I would say there's probably going to be, um, you know, I think we're going to see a big push to move back to a lot of things. I think a lot of companies are going to try to move back. So I actually think there'll be some things that stay, um, but ultimately I think there's a lot to be said for what we missed, um, especially in the B2B space where you operate like, so events were, were a big loss for a lot of companies. Um, a lot of deals in this space we work in are still handshake deals. Right, there's still a reality to that. We're digital marketing. We can bring horses to water. We can't make them drink. That has to be done. I mean, you're signing multi-million dollar contracts. You don't do that by clicking buy now. Right, that's a it's a relationship thing. So I think relationship in our space will still be the driver. It's just going to be reformed. So we'll still see Zoom. We'll still see a lot of remote, more lifestyle kind of you know changes that that work out. But from a digital marketing perspective, we'll see more of this, and we'll see people go back to the office. I think the whole I think there'll be some work from home re residue, but I think the majority will be back to the office in the next two to three years. Um, I think culture is going to win that personally. Um, and plus just the speed of business will, will need it. Um, but I think we'll see email stay. We'll see, you know, the amount of digital, we'll see webinars. Webinars were huge last year. We'll see those stay as alternative ways. I don't, I don't think anyone really got virtual events right. So I think there'll be a lot of startups trying to still figure that out. How do you get masses of people together to for an experience and you know, with VR and all that kind of stuff. We'll see some of that kind of maybe re keep growing as, as an alternative to that. But I mean, I've seen nothing but people loving getting back together in person, which I think is natural. It's, you know, how we were made to be with people and be together. And so I think some of those things will fall away, but what will stay is still the digital channels like email that we've seen before kind of keep working. Yeah, I, I can uh, relate to the in-person events and and like you said, the you know the hybrid events where people will be in person and on Zoom or an, uh, or whatever web streaming program, right? And uh, case in point, we're doing that today where we're having. 35 people in person, we had to limit how many we could, but then, you know, the rest of them are all signed up to, to watch streaming. And I think that's going to continue to stay and not necessarily because people don't want to uh, come to the event. It's just a convenience factor, right? Yeah. Less commute time, you know, all of those things. It's just a, a way to now be convenient. And I think that that's going to continue to, to happen. And I know my staff, you know, I don't always know who's going to be at the office or not if they're working from home mm -hmm. or as long as they're getting their work done. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah I think yeah. it definitely, op it definitely opens up the, the kind of work lifestyle style kind of things. I think, you know, as thinking about a lead generation marketer, you know, as we, our perspective, you know, with virtual events, I mean, it, they still work. I think they're going to be a second tier of, of visitor, right? The people who come are definitely more engaged than the people who go to zoom. Right. I mean, there's, right. there's some of that that we're going to look at and see, you know, what those options are. I mean, there is convenience factor. I mean, it, I think technology, what we got from the pandemic in the big picture, I think is going to be technology caught up very quickly, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. people are doing events. Now every event will be a live streaming event, right? Which was possible before the, you know, the, the kind of event, but the reality is now it's readily available and expected, right? So technology just got kind of like whiplashed up to modern day 
kind of standards. And so we'll just continue to enjoy those things that maybe these people didn't do because they were either a lot of work or maybe they're expensive or, you know, just more set up. But now it'll be just more of a standard thing. Like you may be able to go to concerts virtually now, but you, you know, you go in person too. Like it's your, your choice. Yeah, I definitely can see that happening more and more. So let's talk about um, kind of some of the things that you've done to help market your business since we are on a marketing expedition and, mm-hmm. and maybe your book too. Just uh, tell me about some things that you've uh, been able to do to help get your messaging out there and help get your book promotion and you know all the things that you've been uh, actively doing that's worked for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, so it speaks to the book specifically to start and we talk about the agency as a whole. So for the book, I mean, doing a lot of conversations like this, I mean, we like talking to people, like sharing the news and kind of the story of what the book is and how it can help um, do that. I mean, we do some paid generation on Amazon, which is, is good. It's fine. It's a distribution channel. But, um, you know, the strategy of the book is different, right? The strategy of our book is to really give it away as much as we can, the information. I mean, cost money to print it, but we want the information out there. Um, so I'm not trying to be a, uh, you know, Seth Godin on this to, you know, kind of live off of the book sales, but in a sense to share the message, get it out there. And so our strategy is different. So, you know, we use Amazon for some of that. We use a lot of in-person events, um, speaking, podcasts. Those are our main emphasis. So we don't do much other marketing besides that. Like I didn't do a big book launch, so to speak. We want to just kind of keep more kind of bring this to the audiences I think would benefit from it the most and really who need that framework to think above just the day-to-day tactical aspects, but to that bigger sense. So that's been working well for us to continue to do conversations and kind of build up that repertoire that way. And then, you know, from the agency side of things, that's a whole other ball of wax. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a different space, but the agency side, I mean, we are a lead generation agency. So we, we should be able to do what we do and, and we do. So, um, you know, a lot of our stuff comes from online, from SEO, from paid ads, things like that. I mean, we don't do a lot of like RFP work or anything like that. We're, we're way more, we get leads offline. People find us and fill out our forms. And so that's what's driven the growth of our, our agency over the years. And that took, took time to get there as it does for every company, but ultimately it's, it's the, the right investment, especially if you're a lead generation firm. Like I would expect a branding firm to have a great brand. Um, lead generation firm should be getting all the leads online. So that's what we do. Yeah. And it's, it's seemingly just in the sea of online now that everyone's kind of turned to digital and cutting through the clutter. What are some tactics that you've taken that have been highly successful in being able to generate those leads now, especially since there's just so much out there. Is there a path that people can learn from you to, to take that might, um, make their, uh, lead generation a little more effective? Yeah. And, you know, these, a lot of these ideas are actually not my own, but I'll kind of give some, some name drop to, to some of them. But I think as an agency owner, for speaking to the agencies or creative professionals, um, is trying to find the balance between the market you serve and, and the service you provide and kind of finding that right mix. Um, so I, I definitely am an advocate of niche niching or finding a niche that you can serve. So we're B2B tech and do lead generation and brand work. So we don't do donut shops, even though that'd be awesome. We don't, we don't, we don't take anything that comes by. Um, we have a very specific niche. So we've developed expertise. And so we have expertise in what we do. So my recommendation for anyone who's out there who's not already determined at least a vertical or at least a product or service they want to focus on. So if you want to do logos, great. Just do logos. Don't try to end up doing billboards and other stuff too. If you're like a freelancer, like find a real strong product you can do or real strong industry you want to serve and go in that direction. I mean, we, you know, started this agency 12 years ago um, and I didn't just break off from another big agency and we started from the ground up. So we started the same place everybody else does, which was zero customers, right? So how do we get to working with Fortune 500 customers is we picked a niche, right? We started building that niche, doing content marketing, lead generation, SEO, and demonstrating our expertise through speaking, blogs, things like that, really a a uh, very typical, in a sense, content funnel, but having really polarizing things to say. And after 10 years of doing it, we've got a very niched position and a very, you know, kind of articulated expertise in the space and customers want that, right? So it's, they kind of come to that aspect. So that'd be my biggest recommendation for people. There's still a lot of generalist firms out there. And I, there's a, a consultant, David Baker, if you've heard of him or not, it's a great, great consultant. He talks about this a lot, but 
he's helped our firm in many cases. But you know, we have this tendency to want to, as creatives, to just you think that limiting limits our creativity, and it's a total lie. I mean, we do some amazingly creative stuff right now, more creative than we've ever done, and we serve just a couple times of clients. Um, the, the reality is that creativity, you think it's a narrow door and you walk through and it's huge. Um, it's just your perception from the outside. So um, I definitely recommend a lot of his thinking and work for agencies who are thinking about how do they increase their lead generation, how they get bigger, how they want to scale and how they build up and get bigger clients. The reality is you have to have something compelling to sell. And there's, if you're, if you're, if you're thinking, looking around your neighborhood and you know, your city and you find 10 firms that basically do the same thing you do, um, you need to think about differentiating and niching a bit more. It's the, it's the secret. It's trying to find the golden needle in the haystack. And then the, the needle keeps moving. The haystack keeps moving and trying to target and get those people uh, that you want to have through your, you know, your doors or your proverbial doors, mm-hmm. I say. <laughs> mm-hmm. Everything's yep. digital now. So yeah, clicking on links and clicking on things that help them get further down the path of the buyer journey, right? Um, yep. so that, yeah, that's good. I know. And, and it's, it's interesting because during the pandemic, automatically people think, oh, we have to cut marketing, right? We have to cut that out because we need to survive. And I'm always like preaching to say, you know, marketing should be the last thing that you cut, not the first thing you cut. Uh, Did you have any experience with that and having to kind of explain to people that that's not the the right strategy or tactic to take to cut your budget? Absolutely. So I would, you know, I'd I'd say this for everyone thinking, and you can email me on LinkedIn if you are, you know, if you don't agree with this, but I think, we, we made a decision very early on that we need to do what we're recommending for our clients. We're not going to go to our clients and say, oh, you need to spend. And then we're sitting here hoarding, right? If you're going to truly be a practitioner, or truly do what you do, you need to do what you say you should do and give your recommendations. So we spent money. We spent, we did advertising. We actually boosted our advertising in the pandemic and it paid off. So it actually worked. We got more clients. We people who were out there, we kind of dipped into some markets that were growing in that space. So yeah, we, we totally saw that. And so, you know what, we won't have a leg to stand on in this conversation if we're not doing it ourselves. And so when I went to clients who were thinking about quitting I said, look, here's my AdWords invoice for this past month, right? We're not quitting. Like you can't, you've no leg to stand on if you don't follow your own advice. So my recommendation thing, I mean, hopefully we don't have that issue again in the future, but I think you, know, yeah. you need to kind of walk it out as an agency owner, as a creative, doing what you think you should be doing and your clients should be doing just as a model to be able to say, this is the reality. So yeah, it was, it was something we decided early on, we knew that'd be a case. And so we said, you know, we're going to do that. We're going to spend, we're going to keep going. And it, it ultimately, it paid off. We didn't know it was, we could, the world could have ended for agencies and by May of last year, but um, you know, it, it did pay off and it worked really well. Yeah. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Cause mm-hmm. that's one thing that I think a lot of uh, small to mid-sized businesses are experiencing right now is that, you know, they, they had to go through this and now it's kind of like trying to come out of the pandemic and what's going to be next and what worked, you know, a year ago is not going to work now. And so now they're mm-hmm. really having to rethink their strategies, what's working, what's not omit, what doesn't and automation. Right. And you do, do you do a lot of automation setups and things for people? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of market animation. So just to your point, I mean, that's really the whole basis of the RTX framework is mm-hmm. what to do and what not to do, right? So we talk about the three stages of the RTX. It's assess, ideate, and execute. So every week, every month, really monthly, you're looking at the data. What's working? What's not working? Well, let's try some new things. Let's experiment. Let's ideate. Let's create new marketing channels. Let's, let's, let's tack in that clubhouse thing or let's try some ads over here on this platform. We execute it, run it for a month, for two months, whatever. Stop, assess it again. What's going on? Looking at data. A lot of times marketers get a bad rep because they think we're just throwing stuff against the wall. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of cases it's valid. I've, I've met some people who just do that. They just throw ideas. It's all great. Let's try it. But our, our approach really looks at marrying that to data. So if you've got a data-based approach, you're looking at data, then you're ideating. You're free to experiment because you've got a goal. You've got a process. You're trying, to, you're trying to grow sales, trying to grow leads, whatever it may be. It's your goal. You're assessing the data based on that goal. You're ideating to try to create new ideas and new experiments to do that. And then you're executing and you're just filling that cycle. That's the RTX framework. That's kind of running tornado because every month if something new happens, something changes. You can say, does that fit in to our goal? Can it fit into our goal? Like what's our... How this works? So you're not just randomly experimenting with stuff. You're also saying, does this really help us reach the goal? And so rather than looking at, you know, all the channels and management and all that kind of stuff, you say, what's our goal this quarter to do? 
Here's our, it's going to raise lead count. It's going to raise a certain amount of awareness or whatever it may be. Let's ideate, execute, and assess and look at that based on that goal specifically. Then you get real creative, right? Because once you get to the goal level, it's not about maintaining your Instagram anymore. It's like, well, Instagram's not helping the goal. Cut it. <laughs> you yeah. just cut it off, right? <laughs> so you can kind of be more, more critical when you got something to base against. And a lot of times companies, especially small businesses, they don't really know where things are coming from. And so the fear is like, I don't want to cut Facebook. I don't know if it's really doing anything. I don't want to cut this. I don't know if it's doing anything. And so it feels like a little bit of a, a you know, a, a glass sphere. It's like, you don't want to crack it anywhere because the whole thing might fall apart. That's just really a lack of data. And so if you get good data, you can say, yeah, I mean, I, I've had companies shut down certain social handles because it wasn't doing anything in the long run. They got better at other stuff in the process, trying then to be able to force new things or push new ideas out. Hey, let's go try this thing because here's the goal. Here's what we see. Here's the benchmark data. Let's try it for a month or two and give it a whirl. And with data, that conversation is a lot more productive than just trying to like twist somebody's arm on a gut feeling. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, I, I often will say, and I, I teach um, students at, at Boise State University as well. I'm a marketing professor there. And some of the things that the students are going through now, I mean, they're about to graduate and they're mm -hmm. thinking about, okay, well now where am I, where am I going to go in the future? What am I going to do? Uh, and, and so it's, it's interesting to try to tell them, you know, where things are going because of the changes that have been made and all the things that are happening, but, you know, keeping them up to date, keeping them, you know, uh, uh, current on what is going on. So I guess my question really is if you were to, um, you know, be in front of my students, what would you tell them? What, what should they know uh, going into this market in this field that we're in? Uh, what would you, what would you want to know if you were them now? Good question. <laughs> So I'm gonna, I'm gonna think back, you know, it's been, oh gee, probably more years than I can remember since, well, it's been 20 years, yeah, since I've been in school easily. <laughs> um, so I would probably say similarly what I think my education was. So big up to any Penn State graphic design people listening. <laughs> um, I was luckily under the tutelage of Lanny Samis, interesting guy, um, but we were kind of taught there how to think and not to do. And you know, I've, I've taught at a couple of universities here locally as well. And I think sometimes universities get overly focused on the tools. Mm -hmm. Like no one cares if you're good at Photoshop. Like you need to be good at Photoshop because that's going to get you in the door, but it's not going to be your long-term sell. So trying to get that balance of being able to contribute early, um, but really stressing how to think. And that's again why Red right, Tornado focuses on a process, not like just how to be good at video marketing. Like because video marketing Will, will eventually change and go away and, and shift. I mean, when I came out of school, Flash, you know, people remember Flash, like Flash was really big. There's whole companies built to do Flash work. It's gone. It's absolutely gone. I know guys that went to, got degrees, like focusing on Flash, it's gone. So you think about the long picture perspective as a student, it's really hard when you're whatever, 20, you don't have a very long picture perspective of life yet. But when you kind of realize that everything you're doing right now is going to change by the time you're 40, what should you be focusing on right now? Like, should you really be learning Illustrator 10 or whatever we're on now? I don't even know if they number them anymore, but like, that's just a tool. Like you need to figure out how to think. And so thinking dynamically, being understanding ideas, thinking more strategically. And I think this day and age, any design or marketing student really has to understand data. Like data is the biggest thing. We didn't have a lot of data emphasis when I was coming through school. Um, so just even like statistical analysis, data analysis, like it sounds kind of strange, but I think it'd be more so that, and, you know, wh where data really drives things is going to be the next big piece. Because any strategist, any kind of consultant in the marketing space will always use data and charts to help kind of prove points. And that's something I felt surprised at coming out of school was, you know, I knew about color theory and I knew about line and, you know, all these kind of design topography, letting and you know, how to do, do great spacing and all that kind of stuff. But just being, you know, shot out of the water in a design review and, and kind of with a client on data, right? Like, it doesn't really matter. Like, well, my, my demographic data, if I don't understand the demographic of my client and, you know, some of the information, like the decisions you make on that stuff would really be impactful. Plus you have more to stand on because as design students, you know, you do critiques, which is good. Everyone needs to learn that. And it's the most valuable part of design school, I think, is being critiqued really hard because you learn to get a tougher skin about things. Um, 
I think that's be a big, big part of it. It's really using how you use data to really defend and work through your work in this time and kind of, kind of the, the age we're in right now. So what are some resources or tools that you tap into to keep yourself aware of what's going on and what's coming up? What are some places that you go or websites you visit or podcasts you listen to or things that you get your information from? Yeah, that's a good question. So I try to focus mostly on like the business news. Like, so again, we're in B2B tech. So a lot of things I look at are market trend basis. So trying to look at the big picture of where things are going. Um, you know, people on my team are more tactically engaged with like certain channels and things like that. And so I think because we serve a market, a lot of the conversations I have are strategic with clients in terms of, okay, this is a big shift. This is something happening in your market. Your competitors are dropping out. So there's amazing power in Google alerts. If you haven't used Google alerts, you know, to use something like that, to just basically create your own feeds, right? So I use a lot of Google alerts. I don't I don't feel this necessity to go look at TechCrunch every day. I have searches set up. I have kind of filtering that brings the news to me. Uh, that way I can kind of self audit and kind of look. There's some good stuff like Smart Brief is a good you know, email newsletter piece, but I try to use a lot of custom feeds to bring in the data that I want to see and the keyword, to get the noise out because there's more than you could ever filter through if you just went looking, right? So you need to kind of bring the news to you that's most relevant. So I think that's the best tip I've had because we, we do very specific niche markets. I mean, cybersecurity is like a, a phrase that I use in some of our stuff because a lot of our companies um, fit that niche to, to be aware of the market um, because really the decisions that I'm involved with as a company, as agency, as a high level, when the client understands that you're looking out for their market, not just your invoice, it makes a big difference. Uh, it makes a huge difference. So if you're able to have a conversation, smarter conversation about you know, cybersecurity in this you know, recent Pipeline issue, for example, um, for some of our clients, like that just raises the bar. It shows you've got a vested interest in their company, not just talking about the little tactical thing that you're you're working on. So that's a lot of where I spend my time. So I know a lot more about my clients' businesses than I do about digital marketing in most cases <laughs> these days. But you know, having 20 some years in the business, I get it. Um, I think you know, a lot of my team, I said, a lot of my team kind of pushes into different tactics and bring it up. We've got a whole process because using, actually using Rise of Tornado, like it's how we bring stuff in house and how we adapt, you know, new technology. So we're always looking. If we hear the little inkling of a tool, it'll get thrown onto something and we'll start using it to try it out. And there's just so many tools to, to, to weed through and go through and, and understand, you know, it's almost, almost overwhelming how much you can mm-hmm. learn and get from, but um, what about podcasts? Do you listen to podcasts? Yeah, I do. It's funny, I don't listen to a lot of, of marketing podcasts because, again, so I'm just focusing more on my clients' work and the market as a whole. Um, I think what I listen to, I listen to Bob's. So I'll give Dave Baker another pile out there. That's a great podcast from the industry side of things. I think every designer should listen to that podcast. Um, he and Blair are, are great in that case. Mm-hmm. Um, I would also say that I listen to, um, you know, one of my personal favorites this is the Jocko podcast. I'm a big Jocko fan. If you don't know who that is, you can, you can look it up. Um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, ex-Navy SEAL wrote Extreme Ownership. Um, great, great book as well. And that's about it. I do a lot of eBooks actually, or sorry, like audio books. So I do mm-hmm. a lot. Um, just finished a, a book on Chernobyl, um, you know, kind of doing some audio books there, like history, like kind of seeing how people move and think in psychology. I have, a, I have a minor in sociology as well. So I just love social theory. Um, so it's all kinds of good stuff there. That's definitely good for, for marketing and behavior mm-hmm. analysis and understanding how people want to buy for sure. That's great. Mm-hmm. So uh, speaking of books and your book is an uh, audio book as well, right? Yep. Yep. That should be live any day now. Yep. We just finished <laughs> the recording. I did it. I did it all myself. Um, so it was a fun, fun time to do that. Excellent. And so how do people get a copy of your book? Yep, you can go to ridethetornado.com. Um, so that includes all the different sources you can buy the book from, Amazon, Goodreads, all that kind of stuff, um, as well as linking to that. And there's on the site as well, you'll find there's actually some of the worksheets, some of the process documents. So if you want to actually kind of walk through the RTX framework yourself and kind of think about kind of using data to iterate and kind of create meetings and things like that, all those worksheets are available there as well. So you can really start using that process internally. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Tobin, for sharing all of your nuggets and wisdom for us today. And uh, I'm sure that there's going to be more to come. Do you have more books in the, in the future? Uh, at least three or four. We'll see uh, how fast they get done. 
Yeah. <laughs> I figured there would be more. There's more to come always. Good. Yeah. Um, so any last parting thoughts that you want to share with our audience of, of just, uh, you know, we're on this marketing journey and we want to mm -hmm. understand things. Is there anything else that you'd like to share? Yeah, I would say just for, for marketers out there, you know, thinking about last year, it was a hard year for marketing. It was a hard year for a lot of businesses, a lot of people professionally and personally as well. Um, so I think, you know, just to encourage you that as marketers, you know, we're, we're all about new ground, right? We're all about new expansion, you know, without marketing, there isn't growth. And so I think you need to kind of think about that and just check yourself, make sure you're in that mindset too. If you're, you know, not thinking about growth, not thinking about the next step, not able to kind of get past where you were um, or where last year was, it's a lot of hard internal work, but I think your clients need that as much as they need your service. And if you're still fearful of what's going on, then you kind of deal with that personally. But I think there's a lot of what we bring is not just logos and websites and ad campaigns, and but we bring kind of that light to what is possible and what's going in the market. So get smart about the market, kind of get over last year a little bit. If you haven't done that yet, you kind of think about the future a bit more. Absolutely. And don't just throw things out there hoping it'll work, right? <laughs> no, yeah, use data. Hey, yep. Use data. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for all of this. And um, for our listeners, be sure to go check out uh, his website and download the book. And it sounds like it'll be on audio too. I love audiobooks, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah. And, and then uh, any other questions that you have, we can direct them and we'll put your links in the show notes and everything. And uh, until next time for our audience, of course, it's always wonderful for you to give reviews and share this out to the world mm -hmm. so that Tobin can get his book out to people that need it as much as uh, we need it too. Uh, all right. Well, thank you very much, Tobin. And thank you. And until next time, enjoy the journey. Thanks for listening to the Marketing Expedition Podcast. Find more online at Peppershock.com. Wouldn't it be great if there was one place you can go to get all the latest information and tips about marketing and advertising? The Marketing Expedition community is that place. People like you gather in our online community to build relationships with others and find the latest marketing trends, tactics, tools, and technology. We help you build your brand and your bottom line. Start your adventure today. Visit themarketingexpedition.com to find out more.